So when talking about the eyes, we've got a lot, well, a lot that we can explore. Um, they are, of course, one of the key things to help us organize our movement in general, right? We're very visual creatures. Um, a lot of, there are a lot of interesting hypotheses around the way that our eyes work from kind of an evolutionary perspective. On the one hand, we've got this incredible visual acuity that helps us discern differences in color, differences in texture. And a lot of that thinking is that it helps us identify, well, helped our ancestors, maybe not us, although maybe us at this point, but basically pick out snakes in trees, like actually how to discern, okay, where's a fruit, where's a snake. So we really zoom in on like bright color contrasts. That's a pretty clear thing for us. Like it's good to know where an apple is in a tree of green. Um, but then the other thing is it's good to make sure that thing you're reaching for isn't a branch or isn't a snake. It's a branch, right? So most of us aren't dealing with a whole lot of snake avoidance whilst fruit picking while climbing trees at this point. But it's important to know that that's sort of where the structure, where a lot of the function of the, the eyes developed. So at this point, what we tend to spend a lot of time doing is looking at things very close up for very long periods of time in a pretty narrow range of visual stimuli, right? So we can lose a lot of our visual capacity pretty easily. Um, in my particular case, I've dealt with myopia for the bulk of my life. I think I got my first pair of prescription lenses when I was in fifth grade or so. And myopia is a little different than some other visual challenges like astigmatism, presbyopia, like all these sort of things might be approached in a little different manner. But a lot of the research on myopia or pseudomyopia looks at the idea that we can have a, a muscle spasm in the ciliary body, which is the thing that controls the, the focal length of the lens within the eye. So it's, it's surrounded by this, it's I mean, the muscular nomenclature. It's a smooth muscle. It's like a sphincter of a sort. You know? It's basically the whole thing contracts, the whole thing releases. And like any other muscle, it's prone to sensory motor amnesia, where if we organize ourselves, like if I'm in this particular shape all day, my muscles get very strong in this shape and not a lot of other shapes. Not that they can't come back into this shape, but they just spend the bulk of the time in this shape. So they get the hint like, oh, maybe we need to be really good at this for whatever reason. Okay. So what we often run into then is the brain body or the brain muscle maps get a little fuzzy in that sense, where we don't quite have control over how to decontract some of those tissues. So for example, in this case, this person's gonna have a really tough time finding themselves back up in sort of full normal length, normal, because all of this stuff is habituated to this chronic level of engagement, as has this stuff along the back of the body. So in pseudomyopia, for example, it's like the, the ciliary body is contracted and gotten very adept at contracting to, you know, a, a narrow focal range. Like maybe I only ever spend my time looking at this. I don't spend a whole lot of time looking out there. So then when I go to look out there, it's like the musculature to the eye is asking, like, you want me to lift what? I can't. Like I can't contract that much. Well, maybe that's a, a sloppy way to put it because the more we contract that ciliary body, the closer a focal length we're looking at. So again, this is actually a case of the decontraction for being able to see at distance, kind of organize the, the engagement of the ciliary body to focus on an, an object at distance. So, bringing it full circle into like, what the heck were some of the things I was working with? There were a couple of distinct things. One was uh, a relaxation of the habitual contraction of the ciliary body. And the way that I would begin to work with that is, um, do I have it around? I don't quite have it around. It's in the other room. But one thing I would do, for example, is, I mean, this will work fine. 
actually it won't work fine because there's nothing written on it. This will work better. So I've got a little you know, bracelet with some text on it, sure. So what I would do is basically hold it out to what's the, the active focal length that I have available to me. So I'd hold this thing in a certain distance where I could still see it clearly. And we'll say clearly with an asterisk because there's clearly and then there's clearly with a practice of active focus. So active focusing is where I hold it away to the point where it's a little bit blurry, actually. But you can likely have the experience of if something's blurry and, you know, like you can blink and you sort of keep looking and your eyes do this funny sort of dance, like they hunt a bit to bring the thing into focus. So active focus would be, I'm going to hold this at the little blurry length and just slowly blink, slowly blink. And each time the eyes have this opportunity to reset. So that would be one practice is working with active focusing. And that's sort of, it, it's a neurological practice for the most part. It's like, let's teach the eyes what it's like to kind of get these rapid resets. Like we go through iterative repetitions of each movement in some of our lessons so far, right? And each of those iterations affords us a little different sense of feedback. We can perceive differently. And based on those different perceptions, we can learn something in a neurological sense. So that'd be one thing. The other is from this, you know, kind of easy, normal focal length, let's say. I can slowly begin to bring this object in toward me. Whether it's this little bracelet, whether it's like a Starbucks gift card, whether it's a little pencil with some writing on it, whatever the case is. I slowly bring this in and I track it. I maintain the, the script, whatever it is, in very clear focus. And when I get to the point where it gets a little fuzzy, even at the, like, okay, it's like my muscles don't know how to organize at this level of contraction or that level of decontraction, sort of a window where it's very clear. So I get to the point where it's, you know, not, we'll say effortful, but it's like I have to work a bit to maintain the focus without just going cross-eyed, right? That's not very helpful. So I bring it into this distance. And then as we do with so many of our other movement lessons, it's like I find that contraction and then I work to slowly decontract those tissues. You know, because you might imagine a, a fist, you can squeeze a fist and there's a, a distinct difference between stop squeezing the fist and open up your hand, right? This engages all of the antagonistic musculature, whereas this is simply a, a decontraction of the musculature of the hand. So what I'm looking for in this case is just a decontraction of the ciliary body. So I work to slowly take this further out now, if I wanted to be really precise, I could actually measure the kind of focal length, but it changes so much throughout the day anyway, like huge fluctuations, morning to evening to after computer, before computer. But I basically slowly take this back out until I find that length where, again, I can see it clearly. And maybe I take it the littlest bit farther to work on the active focus practice, that first one. So that'd be one thing. And that's particularly helpful for myopia, pseudomyopia. Basically, I can't focus at distance very well. The other big thing is basically working to uncouple the musculature of the eyes and the musculature of the neck. But maybe before we go into that, let's take a moment to pause. Does all of that stuff make sense? Does that bring up other questions related to eyes, focal length kind of stuff? No, I think it's clear so far. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. All right. So then the other thing that we want to look at is how we can uncouple movement of the eyes and movement of uh, the skull. We'll, we'll frame it this way. The eyes are basically an extension of the nervous system. And excess tone around the eyes can have this corresponding... Um, there's a, a diffusion of excitation, we'll say, through the nervous system, uh, kind of in a radiative tendency. Like if I squeeze a fist, again, my bicep starts to engage, my shoulder starts to engage, and you almost can't help that. 
like this diffusion, this kind of, uh, I think Pavel in the strength world calls it muscle cheerleading, basically. It's like, if you want to brace your core more, you squeeze your fists and you squeeze your butt and then everything else starts to squeeze. So sometimes that works. Um, I believe it was Sherrington who first sort of developed this idea of neurological irradiation through the muscular system. But anyway, so if I have a lot of tension around the eyes, that's like a direct line to the, the vagus nerve basically, where then if I have a lot of tension here, I have a lot of tension right through the central nervous system and that leads to a couple of challenges. One, I'm not as able to perceive subtle differences. In a lot of our lessons so far, we've worked with very subtle movements. Uh, looking at kind of the, the flip side of sharing console, like the Weber-Fechner idea where the, the smaller the movement, or the, the, not the smaller the movement, the lower the magnitude of a stimulus, the greater capacity for discernment I have for changes within the stimulus. It's like the difference in my perception between 305 pounds and 306 pounds is very different from my perception of one pound to two pounds. Because the magnitude of that stimulus is so much lower, I'm able to notice changes in that stimulus quite a bit more. So what we can do then when we reduce some of the neural noise, we can soften some of the baseline neural tone, we're able to notice those subtle changes more. Like we're able to notice, oh, I'm working a lot more at this level than that level. A lot more can be really relative. Like in some of our lessons, if I'm just taking my head side to side, for example, a lot more work could just be the difference between, man, that right side feels sluggish, just thick somehow. Whereas moving to the left has this sense of just ease, a buttery quality. It can be really interesting the, the way we perceive it that way. So what we can do in order to reduce some of that tone and, and ungunk our map of like our head and our eyes moving together, one thing would be this uh, sort of practice of palming. Like I go like this, and maybe I lie on my back and I just take a bit of time to like not have my eyes doing something. Because it's very rare that we actually do nothing, particularly with the eyes. Like we're always reading or watching or whatever. Um, so that's one thing is a nice way to just bring down some of the baseline tension. And the funny thing is that that's not a, a permanent change, but it opens up a window of opportunity where we have this we have this space then to discern with a little greater sense of clarity because we've taken down some of that neural noise so we can find some signal emits that noise a little more easily, a little more readily. So then with that, we can go through little movements of the eyes, little movements of the head, and I mean, in a, a very simplified version, we might say, when I look up, there's a tendency of the musculature along the back of my neck to look up. It's like there's this faint signal like, oh, clearly there's something up there I want to see. So it's not even just the neck. It's all along the, the paraspinals. Like a, all of me is organizing to look up as I look up. Now, we don't <clears throat> necessarily always want all of us to be organized around a particular thing. Because again, differentiation just opens up new degrees of freedom where we have more options available to us. Um, so one thing I might do is I could hold my head still and I could do that through any number of constraints, right? Uh, in the lesson from that I sent out yesterday for today, we have this idea of the nose is fixed on a point and the eyes are looking left and right or they're looking up and down. And even still, there's likely a sense like the head wants to move somehow. So we can add in all other sorts of funny constraints too. Like you can actually kind of hold your head. You can hold it this way. You can hold it that way. You can actively move the eyes relative to the head. You can actively move the head relative to the eyes. You can passively move the head relative to the eyes. And 
all of these different variations of what's active, what's passive, what's moving, what's relative. We're sort of working with this idea of proximal distal reversal, where we tend, for example, to move our legs relative to our pelvis. Like when we think about mobilizing the hip, it's like, well, you do your controlled articular rotations of the, the leg relative to the, the pelvis. But it's not so often that we move the pelvis relative to the leg. And it's a very different neurological experience. We change our intention, we change where we put our attention, it creates a very different experience of the movement. Um, I knew, for example, I was working with a, a client who basically had landed, fallen, caught himself on both wrists, and then was like, couldn't move his wrists. So doing this, for example, was just about impossible for him. He had maybe access to that range of motion. Like, that was it. So since he can't actively move his hand relative to his forearm, we could take a look at the reverse. What's it like to move your forearm relative to your hand? So he would put his hand there and, and work with little lessons on just lifting the elbow and lifting the shoulder. And each of those creates a change in the forearm relative to the hand. Very different neurological experience. Another example in his case would be, can you bring your hand onto the wall in front of you and begin to slide it down the wall only to where it feels comfortable. And again, this is a little more active look in a slightly different orientation, but if my arm is against the wall here and I slide my palm down, in order to maintain this downward trajectory, I have to create this change in the angle between the forearm and the hand. Again, rather than wiggling the hand around distal relative to proximal, I move what's proximal nearest to the center of the body relative to what's distal. So we can do that with the eyes and the head and the neck and, and it can be a really incredible experience of uh, what, I mean, it just, it's a totally different experience when we do that. Like for some people, when they go to move the eyes relative to the head or the head relative to the eyes, they, like, they just clunk. They can't, yeah, they just can't figure it out. It gets to be such a, a an odd, disorienting experience. Um, so I think there perhaps would be like general guiding principles on beginning to work with the eyes and the head. But you know, I wonder, based on all that, what comes up for you? Does that bring up other questions? <laughs> uh, it doesn't necessarily bring up other questions at this point. I'm kind of overwhelmed, but it definitely, a lot of the work that we've been doing, just like just how connected everything is, like the, the eyes can be applied to like almost every other like part of our being. And then I think probably if we even thought about it more, it can be taken to like another level of not embodiedness, but like conceptual you know, changing perspectives and how we you approach a problem and with it from a different angle, you know, say like we were just talking about the physical um, aspects, but yeah, it's sort of a bubbling excitement of not yet really knowing, but just like so much, yeah, things to look into and potential and yeah, so thank you. <laughs> of course, how fun, yeah. <laughs> there is a, a funny thing, I know we mentioned that, um, well, so when we had that lesson the other day, the eyes relative to the diaphragm, relative to the sense of support and all of this. And there really is a, a, a profoundly powerful link between these things where if we're off center, it's like the, the gaze hardens and shrinks somehow and the breath catches somehow. And these can be such potent cues for us then, like anytime we notice this catching of the breath, like, if I were to stay like this, it's a lot of work. And I can feel that like, there's just something in my system that's having to clutch. And there's a, an experience of it in the eyes. There's an experience of it in the breath. There's, clearly it changes like the, the vocal quality that I'm able to bring to this. But if I can come back and find support underneath me, all of a sudden it's like, wow, 
there's stuff happening out here in the periphery and I can breathe and I can speak in a different way. And so we've got all of these little inroads that let us know when we're not stable or when we perceive a threat to our, our own integrity, our own sovereignty. And I think that's where the, the sort of metaphorical, the abstract applications get really important because it's not always as if we're like quite literally hunting for physical stability. I mean, shit, just in the context of everything going on in the world at this point, like the unknown, the uncertainty, the disorientation, like what happens when you pull the rug out from someone, they, they have to hunt for balance. And, and this has totally pulled the rug out from human society. So there's like this hunting, gripping, searching for something to hold on to. And in a weird paradoxical way, it, it's harder to find the right thing to hold on to when our world shrinks and our gaze hardens and narrows. We lose our optionality in that case, our, the whole source of our creativity. Uh, it, yeah, it's a funny thing, our little habitual scared monkey tendencies. 